Good evening. My name is Jethro. I am from South Africa, and I've driven here in my Alfa Romeo. Um, so this is where I'm from in South Africa. It's called the Dargo Valley. It's a small farming community. There are about 2,000 of us who live here. And this is where I grew up. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly small town. We have a pizzeria, a post office, and a petrol station, and that's about it. Um, but it was still a really great place to live. And I went to university in a town about 45 minutes away. I started when I was 17 and I had no chance to travel. So to keep myself you know, occupied, to have a hobby, I bought an old car. Um, right. This is the sort of thing you do for fun in the Dargle, you go climbing. <laughs> um, this was taken at about half past four in the morning in the summer, um, after climbing up, after having a bit too much to drink on New Year's Eve. Um, so, one day, I was, my, my first car was actually a 1973 Alfa Romeo, and it was a bit beat up, and it wasn't really running very well, and I thought, I need to buy a car to take the pressure off this one, something a little bit more reliable, but unfortunately, the car that I bought arrived like this. <laughs> so, this is Julia, my 1964 Alfa Romeo that's outside, this is how it arrived, um, I told my parents I was going to pick up a new car, and when they got home that evening, they found this in the garage and were not too pleased. Um, I'd gone from bad to worse, apparently. So, technically, it is an El Romeo 10504, if you're, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, this is how she looked when I got her. Um, the previous owner had gotten the idea that he was going to restore it, and he pulled it apart and got no further than that. That's how, this is how it arrived. And two and a half years later, this is how she looked. This is in December last year. Right. So, right. During this time, I figured that you know, all my friends had gone traveling. They, they had taken a year off after high school to go traveling, and I thought, I'd like to go traveling too. And having restored the car, I thought, well, I'm on the southern end of Africa, and I love my car, and I don't really want to spend any time away from it, so it only made sense to start driving north. And I thought, I'll go from the Dargle Valley, which is an Irish settler town, to the original Dargle Valley in Ireland, where the settlers came from. Um, so I packed my car, got my visas all sorted, and started heading north in June this year. So, yeah. So this is day one of the trip. This is in Zimbabwe. I'd driven through quite a lot of South Africa at this point, through um, Johannesburg, and this was after the after the Bight Bridge border crossing, which is the busiest land border in Africa, and it's often full of refugees and migrants, and it's very, very difficult. This point was when I knew there was no return, because there was no going back across Bight Bridge. I thought I'd been there for about two and a half hours and only managed to get through by paying a fixer a terrible amount of money. And I thought there was no way I was going to go back. So at this point, the symbolic point in front of the Baobab, I decided I was going to Ireland because it was easier than going back across Bight Bridge. <laughs> So after Zimbabwe, I crossed into Zambia at Victoria Falls. And this is when I started to realize that Africa didn't look the way I thought it did. I'd lived in Africa most of my life, and I still had no idea what it actually looked like. And in Zambia, I came across a house built by a British colonial, a Brit uh, an aristocratic British colonial in the, in the forests in a place called Shiwa and Gandu. And this was my first sort of surprise out in the African bush. I spent a good few days here sort of drinking gin and tonics with all the boozed up British colonials. And I was quite worried that I might just end up staying there for the rest of my life and just becoming one of them, which would seem quite easy, actually. Um, after Zambia, I crossed into Tanzania, which was the first place I really felt far from home. East Africa, they speak a different language. They speak Swahili, and I sudden, and everything changed from the sleepy sleepiness of Tanzania and, Zim and Zambia to the chaos of Tanzania. I thought I was, for the first time, I was actually, you know, pretty far away from where I could call home. Here, I, I thought this photograph was interesting because this looks quite a lot like home. It looks like the Drakensberg mountain range in South Africa, and I always thought Tanzania was. Serengeti and Kilimanjaro, but and actually it looks quite... It, Tanzania, it changes every 100 kilometers. It's an incredibly um, varied country. 
Um, this is how you would transport coffee in Tanzania, apparently. Um, there's quite a lot of that. And unfortunately, I didn't get a photograph of it, but one of these chaps rode up in front of my car and took a selfie with his smartphone while it was going along. I thought that's very modern. Well done. Um, so through most of Africa, you can actually camp fairly comfortably and fairly safely. A lot of the hotels are quite, uh, are quite gross, but I... Um, this was, in Dar this was in Dar es Salaam, which is actually, it's quite strange because this city has a bit of a reputation for being a really horrible place. And I had a great time in Dar es Salaam. I spent about two weeks on the beach with some really good friends, not doing very much. But, you know, this was the start of what I called Tent City. This was day one. It was me and one German chap. And w by two weeks, we had a sort of village on the beach full of with a whole bunch of different tents, mostly people from sort of Germany and Denmark. And it was just really, really fantastic. And everyone seemed to be slightly alcoholic, which was fine by me. <laughs> so this is Dar es Salaam, this terrible city that everybody has an awful time in. But I, I thought it was just fantastic. Yeah. Dar es Salaam is actually quite a large city. It's got about four and a half million people. And it's a port city, the biggest port in East Africa. But the road going into it is one lane in each direction. Um, yeah, it has the infrastructure of a small village, which is why you would sit in a traffic jam for about three hours outside Dar es Salaam in any one direction. That I found quite strange. So it wasn't just me doing um, an overland trip. I met these overlanders in Dar es Salaam. They were uh, Land Rover enthusiasts, and we're going from Nairobi to Victoria Falls, which is about 3,000 kilometers. And they were quite shocked to hear that my car had made it all the way from South Africa, because Alfa Romeos are just supposed to break down all the time. Italian cars are meant to be very, very unreliable. And at this point, I hadn't even had a flat tire, so they, um, they were quite surprised by this. Um. After Dar es Salaam, I moved up the coast, left all my friends behind heading north, and I camped in this small village called Bagameo, which was the old German capital of East Africa, in the rain for about a week, which was quite depressing. After the great party that was Dar es Salaam, I was sort of on my own for the first time in the rain, which was not very good for my spirits. And here I got food poisoning that was so bad, I thought I was actually dying of malaria. Um, the owner of the hotel where I was staying told me to just calm down. You're not actually dying. You've just got food poisoning. You know, stop being such a softy South African. <laughs> so after Tanzania, which is, you know, it, it is quite quite a poor country. I went to Kenya, which was my favorite country on the on the trip so far. My favorite in Africa. It's everybody in everybody in Kenya is really really friendly and really really nice and. They love cars. So this is a Rolls Royce that I saw in, at a car show in Nairobi. And everybody there was so, so fantastically modern. They were well-dressed and well-spoken, and this event was really, really well-run. And this was not the Nairobi that I'd heard about. Everyone said, you know, you can't go to Nairobi. It's just, it's dangerous, and, you know, it's an ugly city. And I had a ball in Nairobi. I thought it was fantastic. Um, this is another shot from, this is actually the largest vintage car event on the African continent that happens in Nairobi. And I just happened to be there the week that this, that this car event was being held. Um, so unfortunately, Nairobi also has another side. And this was one day that I went through the Kibera slum, which is the largest slum in um, urban Africa. We, I ended up going through here because the traffic in Nairobi is so terrible that you, can, you can't actually drive around. So I parked my car and I rented a motorcycle with a driver. And he said, oh no, you know, the quickest way to get, from, to get into the center of Nairobi is just to go through Kibera. So we did that on a regular basis. And actually the people there were quite nice, quite friendly. And although it was very poor, Kenyans lived up there to their reputation of warmth and hospitality. It was very, very touching. So this is on the road again. This was one of the most difficult days I did. This was a 14-hour drive from Nairobi to the border with Ethiopia. And in the background, that's Mount Kenya, which is 5,200 meters above sea level. Um, here, the, the road north of Nairobi, after, about, after a couple of hours, it starts to deteriorate. And I, had, I, I, I sort of believe that I had built the car well enough to sustain this kind of um, abuse, really. And after this day, I thought, okay, you know, I've, you know, I've gotten through everything that Africa could throw at me. I'll be fine. However, a few days later, I, I discovered what Africa could really hold. 
um, in Ethiopia, which is a beautiful, beautiful country. Um, I had stones thrown at me and I had children scream at me in there, sort of tens of thousands as I drive across. They, they shout, you, 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 give me money. And, and sort of a, a crowd of 40 or 50 people, which was quite intimidating. But also in Ethiopia, they have the worst roads I've ever seen in my entire life. This road I drove took me 16 hours to do about three, 300 kilometers. And I was genuinely afraid that I was going to destroy the car and I'd have to ship it home in a container. So you can see there's more pothole than road surface in a lot of Ethiopia. Yeah. Ethiopia is a country with about 85 million people. And so, and they all live along the sides of the roads. If you stop anywhere, and this, this happened, I stopped to look at the view and these two children just kind of popped out of the bushes to come and speak to me. And they, they, were, quite, they were quite nice. They were selling some strange, <laughs> like um, Ethiopian artifacts. But um, yeah, Ethiopia really doesn't look like the Africa I had imagined. It was sort of green and lush and beautiful, which is a nice contrast to northern, the deserts of northern Kenya. This is Gondar in northern Ethiopia. It's uh, an ancient town from about the 15th century. I suppose not that ancient to Italians, but um, it had these sort of ancient um, Indian architecture, which I thought was quite fascinating. I really hadn't pictured anything like this. And after Ethiopia, I was going to Sudan, which was the country that I had been most worried about. I'd been told you can't do this trip because you're going to have to go through the Sudan, and that is impossible. However, I found the Sudan to be one of my most pleasant experiences. So this is what a lot of Sudan looks like. In the south, it's a big food basket. There's lots of crops, it's very productive. And um, this, my first day in Sudan was a complete surprise to me. Unfortunately, this night, I got caught in a storm and was unable to put my tent up because um, the wind was so strong that I slept in the back seat of my car, which is not very big. Um, um, these are the sort of places where you'd stop for lunch in Sudan. It's quite simple, um, but quite prosperous. You can still get a bottle of cold Coca-Cola if you want. Um, these are the pyramids in Sudan in Moreau. I have a picture of these on my desk at home, which is why one of the reasons I wanted to do this trip. I'd been staring at it for about four years. I thought one day I'd like to see those pyramids. And after this, I camped just in the desert nearby, drove out, completely in the middle of nowhere, put up my tent and had the most blissful sleep I'd had in months. It was really quite lovely. And in the morning, this is the only person who came across my campsite, a man on a camel, who was very, very nice. Um, spoke really good English as well. Very strange in the middle of, this, of the Sudanese desert. And I got to go on the camel, which was very nice. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, the Sudan I found, I, the cleanliness of it and the, the peace of it, I really, really enjoyed. I was, um, I was quite pleased with the Sudan, despite its terrible reputation. It, was, it, was, it is one country I would definitely return to. Yes, this, is, this man pulled up along the side, uh, alongside the road and he, he got out of his car and just asked me you know, to take a photograph of him. And then he quickly drove off. Um, I'm not quite sure what that was about. So Egypt was a country I'd been looking forward to. I thought it would be a good holiday destination. Unfortunately, like the Sudan, its reputation is a little bit skewed from the reality. I found it quite dangerous and quite unfriendly, and I left after five days. Um, I found the cities quite untidy, um, and I had been detained by the police for probably a total of about 12 hours standing out in the sun while they searched my possessions and questioned my motives for being a tourist in their country. Um, however, it wasn't all bad moments. Um, this was in Aswan. It was quite beautiful. Um, all over Egypt, unfortunately, thanks to the revolutions and the collapse of the tourism industry, there are abandoned hotels and resorts, which is something I don't think they will ever be able to repair. It's, a, um, it's unfortunate. And after four months of traveling in Africa, I arrived in Israel to take a ship from Haifa to Greece and Greece to Italy. 
and I'll continue from here to Norway and then up to Ireland um, early next year. All right.